ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to another session of uh, the Greens List Breakfast Briefing. And as I said uh, a couple of days ago, what a wonderful way to start the day. Um, mixing with colleagues, uh, eating croissants and quiches just as the day is breaking in Melbourne. Um, my name is Caroline Kenny, and I'm a, a silk on Greens List, specialising in commercial law. Um, but um, unusually, I suppose, for barristers, I'm not here to blow my own trumpet, but really to, splow, to speak of the credentials of the two presenters this morning, Rena Sofrano and Stephen Jeruka. Uh, this morning, um, the topic for this morning's breakfast is removal of restrictive covenants. Um, they, the two presenters have prepared a very er erudite paper on this area of the law. Um, which contains useful suggestions on how to address problems which arise during the course of removal. Both presenters are barristers on Green's List and between them they have wide-ranging experience and more than qualified to present on this topic. Rina Sofrono is an experienced junior barrister. Um, she has had um, before she moved to Melbourne some years ago, she practised at the New South Wales Bar for some 14 years. And before being called to the Bar, she was an associate to Justice Burchett of the Federal Court. She practised as a solicitor in commercial litigation at Freehill, Hollingdale and Page. Uh, she served in the RAAF Reserve from 1996 to 2000. And if that history were not enough, Rena also holds a Master of Analytical Psychology. So Rena will always look at things from different angles and it would be very difficult to pull one over her. Rena has appeared in several significant commercial cases in New South Wales, Victoria and the Federal Court, including the long-running tobacco case. The next presenter is Stephen Jerika. Stephen has many years of practical experience in banking and finance, property and commercial law. He is admitted to practice in England and Wales and has worked in London in real estate and capital financing markets at the prominent law firms of DLA, Piper and Allen and & Overy. Prior to that, Stephen worked at Maddox in the property and construction group where he gave advice on a broad range of property transactions. So I hand over to the presenters. Thank you. Good morning everyone and welcome. Uh, thank you for getting up so early uh, to come along and listen to our presentation about uh, restrictive covenants and easements. Now this morning we're going to focus on predominantly how to remove and vary restrictive covenants and that's because that's where the most of, of the case law uh, comes from and also that's where you get most of your questions from. Well that's where I have anyway. So and then we'll touch on easements towards the end. Now, recent land registry figures suggest that at least 65% of freehold title uh, are subject to one or more easements and about 79% are subject to one or more restrictive covenants. So that should get your attention. If you haven't come across it before, you definitely will. And essentially, it's fundamental to the enjoyment of a property. Uh, development opportunities can be greatly enhanced uh, if the covenants that are burning the land are removed. So you're able to develop it, uh, get more dense uh, development happening, and ultimately more money for your client. And we hope that you'll excuse the joint presentation format. All we're missing is the coffee mugs and the armchairs to make it a proper American morning program. There are two reasons we've done it. The first is that we've decided that listening at this ungodly hour of the morning, in, in my view, as a little owl, to um, the one speaker for half an hour and then another for another half an hour is a more strained way of doing it. But also we have co-prepared the paper and in doing that, I've, for example, done a survey of Ostley decisions uh, because the VCAT jurisdiction is mainly to be found there if you want to find their cases. 
There have been 30 dealing with restrictive covenants from the period beginning of 2009 to thus far in 2010. And to endorse what Stephen is saying, it's certainly a fruitful jurisdiction. We refer to some of the more interesting of the VCAT decisions as not notifications in the paper, um, but suffice it to say you won't be surprised to learn that for the most part trawling through the decisions gives you just a series and a feel for the subjective considerations that the court is taking into account when it considers the question. So to save you having to do it, we've captured some of them that we've put in the paper and will give you a sense of the proportions of, of how they're found in the, in the course of the talk. Okay. Thanks, Rena. So today, this morning, we're going to, I suppose, the structure of, of, of the presentation this morning, we'll talk about the basics of what a restrictive covenant is. We'll go through the trends, what types there are, checklists that you should be looking out for uh, when you do uh, get a client about this sort of problem. Uh, then we'll go to the main topic of how to remove and vary restrictive covenants. And there's three main methods. We'll go through those in, in great detail and also have some case law for you at hand as well. So firstly, what is a restrictive covenant? Well, it's a private agreement between landowners essentially, which restrict the way uh, land can be used or developed. So remember, it's not something that's administered or governed by the council or, or the minister for that, uh, in, in that respect either, and it's registered on title in Victoria uh, with the Torrens system. What isn't uh, a restrictive covenant? A Section 173 agreement, for those of you that are familiar with 173s pursuant to the Planning and Environment Act of 1987. And the reason why uh, is because 173 agreements which are registered on title and are covenants, they're not a restriction within the meaning of the Subdivision Act of 1988. So that's, that's worth to, to bear in mind. Uh, and it's not a definition of, restricted, uh, of, a, of a registered restricted covenant. So don't worry about 173 agreements when you're looking at restrictive covenants. And you look at sections three of both of those acts, the Subdivision Act and the Planning Environment Act for just the definitions for that. Uh, and responsible authority is uh, the council or the minister. Now, there are different types of restrictive covenants. I'm sure you've come across the, the single dwelling uh, example. Uh, you also come across heights uh, and size of buildings, materials used in construction, can even be super, superficial, like what colour the paint is uh, on, on the front of the home. Uh, you've got brick, brick veneer, single storey uh, covenants as well. And then you've got, of course, the, the no quarrying or the digging covenants, where you might have trouble getting a swing pool or an underground carport uh, to your home or on, on your land as well. So they're the things to look out for. Although, um, as you can tell so far, we do propose to give you some practical guidelines and checklists to bear in mind when you have a matter involving a restrictive covenant, it's worth just for the moment taking a step back and considering the area uh, as a whole. Restrictive covenants, of course, well predate uh, planning law in Victoria. And some have referred to the restrictive covenant as a form of private town planning. In fact, that's not totally true. It's true to say that restrictive covenants convert a contractual arrangement between individual parties into a proprietary right that runs with the land itself, a bit of alchemy that, that has some interest if you, if you think about it. Um, and that, of course, stands in contrast to government public law approaches to town planning and especially as Melbourne has expanded the requirement to develop policies with <coughs> sufficient expertise hopefully of the planners in setting up planning schemes. Um, courts or more frequently VCAT now stand at the junction of these two planning methods and that is again an interesting factor. Once upon a time planning law was considered to be in a public law hat and as I've mentioned, restrictive covenants by virtue of their contractual basis were in a private one. You could go and get a permit uh, 
to adjust, make some adjustment to your property, have that heard and decided and even a permit granted, notwithstanding the existence of a, a covenant on your title that would prevent the actual work going ahead. Um, <coughs> that was then seen as your problem to go to some equity court, the Supreme Court, and have the, the covenant lifted and never the twain met. In December 1993, when the current section 60 uh, and subsections were introduced into the um, into the Act, what some tribunals had called an emasculating provision, there was attempted to be some kind of bridge between the two, hence the court and the tribunal sitting at the junction between the two. Because what <coughs> effectively happened was that whereas planning had its own criteria that had to be met, and the Supreme Court under the Property Act had their criteria to meet, now there was added over the top some quite restrictive or stringent criteria that would have to be considered in applying for a permit, in circumstances we'll explain to you, and also <laughs> before VCAT when an appeal was brought from a decision of a planning authority. And that somewhat uneasy marriage gives you now three options effectively, each of which sits slightly uncomfortably with, with the others. And it's worth bearing that in mind, otherwise when the Supreme Court judgments and the VCAT judgments start talking about that admixture of planning issues or covenant issues, remembering that they were separate with now a bridge over them helps make sense of some of the decisions and mm. works as a suitable background. Now if we could just touch on some important concepts relating to the enforceability of, of covenants. You have land that's burdened by the covenant, so land where the covenant restricts the use or development. And then you have the land that's benefited by the covenant. So that's where you have the owner of the land uh, that's benefited can take legal action against those that are burdened uh, by the covenant and they actually need to comply with the restrictions of that covenant. So the, the covenant may be very limited in its coverage, uh, perhaps with only one lot burdening and one lot benefiting, or there may be, for example, many lots uh, uh, that are burdened and benefiting at the same time. And a good example of that is We've got an estate developer, uh, and, and they've placed a restriction on the development of each lot. Perhaps it's just to have one single dwelling on each lot. Uh, and all or many of the lot owners have the benefit of being able to enforce that restrictive covenant on each other, essentially. <coughs> so it's important just to understand uh, the important concepts of the, of the covenant, what land is actually burdened, and who can enforce the covenant. Uh, and these. I suppose details can be uh, seen on the face of the title, but you really got to go behind the title and find where the covenant exists. So normally it's in a transfer or an instrument. So they're the provisions you'll be looking at. Now we hear you say, steady on. We turned up for a removal or modification um, of covenant. What's this talk about enforceability? Well, we're very glad you asked that question because one of the first take-home messages we, we need to give you is, um, that the very existence of a mention of a covenant on title does not correlate to an enforceable covenant. I'll say that again, just because you find reference to a covenant does not mean that that covenant is a restrictive covenant and that it's enforceable. Um, that little trick of the trade is useful before one goes off and suddenly starts assuming that one has a, a Supreme Court application to vary or remove it. Um, the case of Fit and Luxury Developments <coughs> Proprietary Limited, a 2000 decision of Justice Gillard in the Supreme Court, we've given you the references as we go through the paper. It's a case that usefully sets out the original development and principles applicable to restrictive covenants. And it draws attention to, and in the earlier authorities of the 1960s and 70s referred to in it, draws attention to the practice of various registrars um, from time to time to register covenants regardless of whether or not they were enforceable restrictive covenants or just personal agreements. Um, it's therefore incumbent upon anyone dealing with a covenant on title to look behind the fact of its registration to ensure that it's in fact enforceable before worrying about varying or, or removing it. Okay. Another helpful case is Tonks and Tonks of the Supreme Court of 2003. And in that decision, they really, well, the Justice Bongiorno was working out what does A 
restrictive covenant mean? Does it mean one? Or does it mean more than one? And, and in that decision, uh, A does not mean one. Uh, the true construction of the covenant is that it prohibits the placing of any building on land unless that building is a dwelling house. So the covenant actually said nothing about the fact that it should only just be one. Uh, and it didn't talk about the number of dwellings either. So he gave it a more general interpretation. So the covenant in this case did not restrict the owners from erecting more than one dwelling house. So just remember when you come across a dwelling house, it can mean more than one. Also, that decision was followed by Gubby and Mornington Peninsula, Shire Council, uh, essentially along the same lines. Uh, here, we had the word, wording a private dwelling house, and that was construed to mean more than just one. You may now be saying, I see, so now we have to construe these things as though they're a taxation statute. The answer is yes and no. Um, the first step is to check the covenant itself. Does it touch and concern the land? Is it actually about land usage? Um, sounds like a basic question, but it's worth checking it even at that level. Um, is the land benefited reasonably proximate to the burdened land, or are they so far apart that it actually breaks the idea of the, re the restrictive covenant um, benefited land and servient land arrangement? Is this actually a proprietary burden, what I've touched on before, or actually, in fact, a personal covenant that's actually confined to original contracting parties? That's taking up the warning that Justice Gillard had given in the FIT case. Does it make sense? Are the obligations, in fact, ascertainable, or is it very vague and aspirational about keeping the neighbourhood nice? Um, is the beneficiary a successor to the original covenantee? Um, and you should note in that regard that Section 78 of the Property Law Act includes owners and occupiers of the time being of the land to be benefited. <coughs> so um, successor <coughs> has a slightly extended meaning for the, for the purposes of mm. this. I can hear you all saying, how do we get rid of them? Well, there are three main ways. Uh, the first is, if it's authorised uh, by a planning scheme or an amendment to a planning scheme, and that's pursuant to Section 60, Subsection 5 of the Planning and Environment Act, which we'll, I'll just say we'll call the Act for, from now on. And if it's authorised by a permit under the same section of the Act. And thirdly, if it's pursuant to an order made by the Supreme Court, however, it's made under Section 84 of the Property, and Property Law Act of 1958. So with the first one, let's talk about how uh, we can get it removed by a provision of the planning scheme or an amendment to the planning scheme. Um, and in that regard, thank God for the internet, um, the planning page of the Department of Planning and Community <coughs> Development's website is a very useful tool. It's at www.dse.vic.gov.au, not only for um, an introduction to planning, which is probably more at lay um, customer level, but also usefully it sets out the purpose of a planning system. Each municipality in Victoria, you, you doubtless know, is covered by one. Um, Victoria has 81 planning scheme area, areas and therefore 81 planning schemes, one for each of the 78 municipalities and one for three special planning areas, the Alpine Resorts, the Port of Melbourne and French and Sandstone Islands. The function of it is to set out policies and provisions for the use, development and protection of land. The first uh, column, if you like, of the, of the bridge structure I had dis described to you before, where <coughs> at policy level, the, um, facili to facilitate fair, orderly, economic, sustainable, environmental use of the land, it has been um, enshrined in that. More importantly, the actual planning schemes applicable are to be found at that website. So you can actually look up in respect of a particular municipality and check the <coughs> contents of the planning scheme itself. Planning schemes are, there's not a lot of case law about the amendment process that Stephen's going to discuss. The statutory basis is set out at parts 1A, 2 and 3 of the Planning and Environment Act. Mm -hmm. So essentially you're asking council for a planning scheme amendment uh, to remove or vary a restrictive covenant. Unfortunately, we don't have much case law concerning this, and it's really governed by the provisions of the Act. So 
I will talk to you a little bit about the amendment process. Now, it's costly. That's the first thing. Um, anyone asking for a planning authority to prepare an amendment will note that the fees are pretty steep. It's about $800 to have the proposal considered and then a raft of additional fees. Uh, now, proponent may, must be able to demonstrate to the planning authority, uh, which is usually the council, adequate justification as to why the amendment should be prepared. So essentially the amendment's going to need to be prepared. It's got to be authorised by the Minister of Planning. Uh, then it's actually placed on public exhibition for at least one month. And then after that, an independent panel uh, will come about and consider the submissions that are made. Uh, more fees. Uh, an indicative fee is around $1,200 per day uh, for as long as the panel has to sit. So it's quite costly. Uh, and when it receives the report from the panel, the planning authority must either adopt or abandon the amendment. So the amendment becomes part of the planning scheme when it's approved by the minister and when notice is finally given uh, in the Victorian Government Gazette. Now the advantages of uh, this process is that the applicant does not need to overcome variation tests that apply to applications under the permit, which we'll talk about later on. The disadvantage, apart from the cost, uh, is that the criteria in fact applied by a panel is unclear. So uh, there's considerable uncertainty as to what's involved in the process and how they come about it. Now, we've come to the second <coughs> method of removing or, or varying a restrictive covenant, and that's where it's, if it's authorised by a planning permit. And we, we've included some useful uh, comments there in the paper as to what does the Act, as amended by the Planning Environment Restrictive Covenants Act, actually do. Well, essentially, things need to get considered when anything that would uh, result, anything that results in a breach of the restrictive covenant. That's it, that's it in a nutshell. And then, then you're asked, what must applicants for permits do if their land is burdened by a, a registered restrictive covenant? Obviously, they've got to provide a copy of the covenant uh, along with their application and details of any land that's benefited, uh, sorry, and details of the land benefited by the covenant if required. Now, who receives notice? in these sorts of uh, situations. Council must ensure that notice is given uh, to the owners of the occupied uh, land and those that are benefited by the covenant. Uh, and this would be in addition to the notice uh, that must be given as part of the development application, which is entirely a separate issue. In the case of Giannakis and Glenara City Council of 2002, that VCAT decision is on that point as well. So. Talking about decisions on applications, the section to look at in the Act is section 61, subsection 4, and that pretty much provides that if the grant of a permit would authorise anything which would result in a breach of a restrictive covenant, then the Council must refuse to grant that permit unless the permit has been issued or a decision made to grant a permit to allow the removal or variation of that covenant. Which no doubt you have all seized on the point that says, ah, this is the difference between the original system that we described to you at the outset of the talk and the current arrangements. Whereas once upon a time, an applicant for permit did not have to, at that time, have anything to do with a restrictive covenant, which was left to another jurisdiction as being outside the planning criteria of consideration. Section 61.4 that Stephen's just read out prevents that grant from result the, the grant of the permit if, if that would result in the breach. The two are now wedded together. In the case of Wade and Yarra Rangers Shire Council, a 2005 uh, VCAT decision, the tribunal noted that it had been held in a number of tribunal decisions that that subsection 61.4 was quite finely read. In other words, it would only prevent the grant of the permit if the grant of the permit itself authorises um, the breach of covenant. An example of that was where you had a single dwelling covenant, quite usual, especially in um, <coughs> metropolitan <coughs> Melbourne, um, a permit to subdivide, which itself is the subject of a separate application, as, as you know, um, itself was saying nothing about how many dwellings were being erected, because subdivision is not the erection. It's only the, the first step before the erection of a structure. And so, whereas the subdivision may have been a prerequisite for the building 
of more than one dwelling, it nonetheless itself didn't actually constitute that. And that had been sufficient for the um, planning authority to really go back to the early bad old days or good old days, depending on how you see them, and say, well, fine, we're only dealing with this subdivision permit. Here it is. Um, however, in considering any application for a permit for subdivision, Clause 65.2 of the planning scheme that was there under consideration before the tribunal, it's worth noting this kind of submerged point, it required consideration in the grant of a permit of, amongst other things, the existing use and possible future development of the land um, and nearby land. So where there is real uncertainty, says the, court, the tribunal in Wade, about the ability to use and develop for the primary purpose as contemplated by the planning scheme for residential purposes, um, the tribunal is to take that into account. Um, the tribunal tended to adopt a cautious approach when considering permits for subdivision where the future development therefore may uh, breach a restrictive covenant despite the fact that the subdivision itself doesn't amount to a breach. What's the point of my telling you this? It's this. The outcome of the decision in the Wade case was a formulation that now is being repeated frequently um, to date. And this is probably the best uh, compromise position that may have to be proffered to a tribunal when you have matters such as this. Um, the member said, in my view, a preferable outcome would be to grant the permit for the two lot subdivision, but include a condition in the order granting the permit, that is, that a statement of compliance must not be issued unless and until the restrictive covenant is removed or varied to allow construction of a dwelling on each of the lots created by the subdivision. And that, be that became enshrined in the actual order, that formulation of words. This course of action will provide certainty to the permit applicant on the one hand that the subdivision can proceed, provided the restrictive covenant is dealt with, and will also provide certainty for any prospective owners of the lots by ensuring that lots are not created that may not be capable of obtaining a permit for the dwelling. It meant going to the Supreme Court to get that, um, mo that covenant modified, but the Wade approach was recently ap applied in um, as recently as 9th of March of this year in a case called Rodney Orjard and Associates, I've given you these um, references, and had been applied in Johnston and Macedon Ranges uh, Shire Council and Patterson and Maroondah. It's worth, um, if you deal with these matters, of just capturing that, um, that carve-out if, it, if it's a case of saving the subdivision permit rather than it failing.